when I got done with the presentation at, at PRA, I had two guys or three guys come up to me and go, well, thanks a lot. I'm going home. I'm selling the truck. What is going on, Diesel Nation? We're excited to have you guys with us today on the Diesel Podcast. Today's episode, I promise the title is not clickbait. It's something that when I was chatting with Cho Performance about this issue, I was just taken aback at how serious this is going to be for the aftermarket for performance upgrades for these Cummins engines. And I wanted to have an in-depth conversation with them. So today I'm going to be joined by Cass and Adam, and they're going to be chatting with us about some major failures that happen on these engines. Um, it's for the 2019 plus 6.7 liter Cummins and it's going to be a complete overview of it so we're not just going to focus on one part basically look at the engine as a whole so if you have one of these trucks or you're thinking about buying one you definitely need to listen to this full episode so that you can understand some weak points that are that are going to be there especially if you plan to add any sort of power to these engines. Before we get to it, though, want to remind you our friends over at Kershaw Knives have a discount code for you. If you use code DIESEL2023 at kershaw.kaiusa.com, it's a great way to save some money, get some cool gear. If you need a knife for hunting, fishing, EDC, at work, around the house, they've had a ton of new releases in 2023, with the Duralock models being one of the newer ones that they have. And the blade's made out of D2 steel. The way that the blade opens and closes is super smooth, keeps your fingers away from the blade when you're operating it. So if you're in the market and want to save some money, definitely make sure head on over to their website and use code DIESEL2023 for 20% off site-wide. All right, let's get to today's podcast with Cass from Choke Performance and talking about why this might not be the Cummins engine that you want to buy if you're going to add power to it. Cass and Adam, welcome back to the Diesel Podcast. I love talking about engines. I know our audience loves to hear about them. And you guys had a topic today that uh, really piqued my interest, which I've heard some things out there about some of the 2019 plus Cummins engines and even some issues that affect them all the way back in the common rail lineup. And you guys have a ton of great information. So I look forward to chatting with you guys today, going through some details, and it's going to be really insightful. So I'm looking forward to learning along with uh, all the uh, all the listeners tuning in. Always good to yeah. see you, buddy. Thanks for having us on. And uh, yeah, it's uh, going to be a little bit different today. A lot of information, I think, out there for for listeners and anybody that's interested in you know failures and failure modes and fixes and things like that. There's a lot of, I think, great visuals. So if, like, I know a lot of our audience listens on iTunes and Spotify, but I definitely encourage them to head over to our YouTube channel, check out this episode, because Cass, you got a, a ton of great information, pictures, things we're going to be going through, which I think are really going to help the conversation, help us understand what's going on. So I wanted to basically turn the podcast over to you and you've discovered and, and learned some really interesting things that we're all going to want to pay attention to. So tell us about some of these I don't, I don't know if they're design flaws, major issues, problems that come up, how we would define it, but I think it's it's definitely interesting, especially if you own a Cummins. Yeah, um, I feel a little bit like today, uh, like your you know, obnoxious uh, aunt or uncle that went to see you know some place they're on vacation and they've got all these slides that they're bringing back to show you. you know, they're putting it on the projector like in the 1970s or something. But, um, now, uh, but the thing is, is it's really difficult uh, to get an understanding of the failure modes, why it's failing, um, what's causing the failure without actually seeing it, right? You kind of got to touch it, feel it, see it to, to understand. So, you know, the major misconception, uh, and I and I kind of beat a dead horse on this, but the major misconception of most things uh, engine related is that, that, you know, how many times have you heard somebody say, well, it was just built on a Friday. Well, it was just built on a Monday. Um, there's always a reason for failure. Uh, these engines don't have brains. Um, they are nothing more uh, than a hunk of metal that is separated by a hydrodynamic wedge of oil. Um, so it's, you know, there is a reason if it fails. Um, and there's there's a lot to be learned um, by uh, dead parts. <laughs> and so I think today um, we just want to hear the story. I feel a little bit like, um, you know, the sixth sense or something, you know, <laughs> that you have to listen to the dead people or something. But um, <laughs> they've had a story to tell. But they're really and truly these parts have. Uh, died a pretty violent life, and today we are forensics, right? So we are the CSI, um, you know, of, of finding out what's going on and, and look at what what they're telling us. And uh, so, with that said, um, you know, I'll talk to cousin Vinny over there. If you'll turn to slide number one, we'll go ahead and get started. I'll be cousin Vinny. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, this is not an uncommon failure for sure for anybody that's had, uh, you know, um, a Cummins 24 valve 
Um, typically, this is uh, this is actually uh, probably one of the more common failures that we see. And we typically see these between two types of engines. Now, don't get me wrong. Today, we're going to really uh, be focusing uh, Cummins platform related stuff. So, um, but there's two major reasons or two major uh um, engine families, uh, and we're going to refer to them as an engine family um, because they, the failures are subject more so with these two families than they are anything else. So what we're looking at right now is a guy that had a really, really bad day. Um, and I can tell you, uh, kind of like the crime scene, let's, let's talk about him just a second. What he was doing, what had happened when he, when it, when it failed, um, you know, it's kind of, kind of some of the things that led up to this. Uh, this failure is obviously a failure of the valve seat. Okay, so for anybody that doesn't know what a valve seat is, it is a portion of the cylinder head that is the interference face uh, that comes in contact with the valve so that it can seal. Uh, these seats were initially uh, on the 12 valve uh, were, a pre were a parent metal. When we say parent metal, what we're talking about is that cylinder heads cast, right? So in the casting process, they will come in and they will where the valves, if the valves were removed out of this head, they would have, um, where the valve would sit, they would come in and induction harden the seat, and then they would cut the profile, induction harden the seat. Um, so every time that the valve closes, it gets slammed closed because of the uh, because of the camshaft profile, because of the spring tension, um, and it starts to wear it. So what's happening with this guy is um, basically th there's nothing there. That valve seat has fallen out because this is a press-in seat. Now, the advantages of the present seat versus the uh, the parent metal seat, which would be just the whole casting of the head in one piece, um, is that the uh, the the seat itself here has better heat dissipation properties, and then also cracking is also an issue. So if you develop a crack in the old 12 valves, it would go across and it would cause um, obviously the, the cylinder head to crack. With this, we can cut the seat out, we can replace the seat, but because it has better uh, heat dissipating properties, we can actually put a stronger piece of material, um, ink and nail or whatever it might be, uh, in that valve, in that valve seat. And that will help 70% of your heat comes out of the valve, uh, from the, the seat itself. So it's really, really important. Actually, it's more than that. It's like 70, I think it's 78%, uh, comes out of the valve seat itself. So it's really important. So what happened with this guy is he was more than likely, uh, most commonly, it'll be a guy that's tuned. Is this obviously we can see this is a 6.7 liter head. It's pretty easy to see because the steam holes between the cylinders. Um, that's different than the 5.9. And so uh, he probably had a hot tune on this thing um, or had the truck tuned. He was pulling uphill and he was on a long break. Um, we see these types of failures in 6.7 power strokes. But, uh, people ask this question. And uh, Patrick, I know you get asked this question probably all the time. Um, EGTs, right? We yeah. everybody says EGT is just a number. Well, how hot is too hot, kind of thing. Or, you know, it doesn't really matter. Okay. Well, you know, if I was to tell you, and I've said this, use this an analogy, and if I say, you know, this pen in my hand, um, hold it up, hold your arm, you know, straight out, hold the pen in your hand. Uh, is the pen heavy? Is is the pen heavy? You'd say, I don't know, absolutely not. I'd say, great. Can you hold it up? Sure, I can. Not a problem. Okay, great. I'll be back in eight hours. Right. Uh, tell me, you know, is it heavy now after eight hours? You said, man, yeah, absolutely. My arm's fixed to fall off. So there's a couple of things about this. Um, the the uh, scavenging through the, the cylinder wall and the, um, uh, or excuse, excuse me, across the cylinder um, is able to, to pull that heat out. But when we put a, a heavy load on an engine and we're pulling up a grade like this, what we're doing is heat soaking all those components. And what happens is, is that the valve seat can deform, basically. Uh, what happens is, is uh, plastic deformation sits in after it reaches a certain point, and it will no longer have the same press fit that it had when the factory installed it or the engine builder installed it or whatever was to happen. Typically, your press fit on a cast iron head can be anywhere from four to six thousandths is, is what would typically run. A lot of guys will go, well, Cummins didn't have quite enough press fit on that. We do increase the press fit. There's no, there's, that, that is true. We do increase press fit. We do use an oversized valve seat on the exhaust as well uh, to combat this. But what was the actual cause of failure? There's a couple of things going on. One obviously was the duration um, for tuning that definitely can cause that. 
that, that cause a valve seat. When you're going up a long grade and you're having this heat uh, applied to these parts for a long period of time, that's the number one thing. Now, if you'll turn to the next slide, what we'll find out is actually what is, is causing it. And why would it be that we see it more in one engine than we do another engine family? Both pistons that you see right here um, are pistons that are going to be based off of a 5.9. Uh, so the one on the right is actually the older 0304, 300 horse, well, 250 to 300 horse. Okay. The one on the left, 0.4.5 to 07. Now you can see there's a complete, completely different combustion bowl on these pistons. The one on the, the right, has more uh, failures for valve seats typically than the one on the left. Now, the one on the left has its own problems. That's 0.4 and a half to 0.7, three and a quarter Cummins. Everybody knows ring compaction. Well, we'll get into that in a minute. But why would that have that much bearing on your valve seat failing on the uh, uh, different year models? Well, here's the reason why. One is obviously you've got a different injector spray pattern. One's 143, one's a 124 degree spray pattern. The flame front, as it's coming across that bowl, the witch's hat in the center, basically the, 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 uh, <clears throat> the, the oxygen is being forced downward and then it reverses direction. When it uh, exits the combustion bowl, it, is, it, it has a, uh, a direct, um, um, it has a direct exposure to the areas of the seat. And because of the flame front being exposing uh, the area of the valve directly, there's more heat that gets applied on the um, uh, on the, the piston on the right. And they did this for a reason. They're trying to force, I mean, the name of the game is, is maintain the heat uh, on a diesel engine, on a diesel application. We're trying to force the heat back towards the center. The further it gets out, the problem with that is, is that we start getting cold spots in the cylinder. Now, one thing you'll notice is, is the number, uh, or the one on the left, the 04 and a half to 07, they don't ever crack. You hardly, rarely ever see those pistons crack. Now you go, well, why? Well, there's, there's a reason for that. And people go, well, the lip, you know, it's not great. You can see that the combustion bowl itself is wide open. It does, it has a smooth radius, but it's not what we would consider a re-entrant piston. It's not forcing the oxygen back to the center of the cylinder. That's the reason why we have more valve seat failures on the right. Now, the problem with the one on the left, and you can go to the next slide, is, and you can probably even see it with that picture there, but if you look at the top ring land, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss this and we'll come back. This is a, obviously a cracked piston. What's going on with cracked pistons? And people complain about that all the time. I've seen them complain and they say, you know, well, the OE had a bad piston. I've, I've seen them blame other piston manufacturers. The reason why the, the, the valve, it's just a bad, bad piston, bad casting, bad this, bad that. Pistons don't crack. There's never been a piston in the world that ever cracked. Um, I've never seen a piston crack. And you're going, well, what are you talking about? There's three pistons right in front of it. Well, none of those pistons actually cracked. They cracked after they were already broke. What they did was they got torched. And if you look at the one in the center, the under power stroke, it's exposed. The Cummins one is too. The Duramax you can't see because that crack started on the other side. So, what happened is, is it burnt, it burnt a hole through initially and it acted like a cutting torch and it just absolutely destroyed uh, the piston. It just blew a hole right through it. Well, when that happens, it starts out a very, very small hole. And what, what uh, begins to happen is, is now that we have a small uh, hole where it's been breached, every time that piston comes up, the oxygen is going into this tiny hole and it's forcing the pressure to the outside. And that's what begins to crack the piston. Now, it also starts to, uh, typically, these are going to be salt bath rings where they have um, the piston cooling jet underneath is spraying into a cavity in the piston. So what happens is it starts burning the oil uh, every time it's actually coming up, uh, or excuse me, every time it's actually on the downward stroke, there's a low pressure area and it's pulling the oil out of that piston back into the cylinder wall, or excuse me, into the cylinder. And then it burns through there and that becomes extremely hot. And that's the reason why that hole becomes so so big. You can see that on both the sides. And like I said, it doesn't take long for it to go ahead and crack. Now, I can tell you the, the orientation of the piston on every single one of these. I can tell you how they were loaded. And I, I don't have to have the engine in front of me. If you look at the pistons and where they're cracked, that's between the exhaust valves every single time. That's where the crack starts. It does not start randomly. And people go, wait a minute. No, see, it's the wrist pin that's 
causing that pressure right there because it's always parallel to the wrist pin, not so. Our case in point, 7.3 liter. It will not crack that way. A 7.3 liter will actually crack in a vertical position. It won't crack along the side of the wrist pin. Check it out. Go Google search it right now if somebody's watching and you'll see it and you go, well, wait a minute. It, then the wrist pin doesn't have anything to do with it. It has absolutely nothing to do with it. The reason why the 7.3 cracks that way is because of where the exhaust valve is located and the scavenging effect between intake and exhaust. Because that is the hottest point in the combustion chamber or in the combustion bowl of the piston is right directly underneath the exhaust valves. Because when the intake's open, I'm getting at least some fresh air and I'm cooling that side of the cylinder. So it's constantly forcing that hot oxygen that as it's being compressed it's getting trapped in that area. You know, the lipping pistons is, is definitely a way to fix this, but what we're doing is we're reducing the heat in that area. Um, there is some trade-off in that. You do get in, in full transparency. Um, you lose a little bit of efficiency, but you gain, obviously, the, um, uh, you gain uh, the, uh, the reliability aspect of it. So that's pretty much, I think that pretty well covers uh, what's going on there. Well, I will say this, a lot of injector manufacturers, and I'm kind of taking up for the guys over there, they're going, well, the injector calls that. Injector didn't have anything to do with that. The reason why I can tell you that is if you look at that Cummins piston that's cracked right there, the spray pattern, you can tell. Now, there's another thing that I will add. Um, tuning is definitely, uh, definitely exasperates this problem. Because of the basically a combined gas law, and we talked about this before, um, what happens is, is that if we increase our injection timing, right? So we're spraying further. What happens is, is our cylinder pressure goes up exponentially. Everything has a fuse. We talked about that before, but here's the way it works. I was talking to somebody the other day that came in. So basically what the life of this thing is and how, how it works is, is the guy before he cracked that piston, most likely on that Cummins, on the 6.7, he blew a head gasket. Then he went back and he put head studs on it. And then after he got done putting head studs on it, he ran it a little while, he cracked the piston. Well, wait a minute. What would have happened if he hadn't cracked the piston? Let's say he had a monotherm piston, this thing, and never cracked. Okay, then it's going to move. What's going to happen is he's either he's going to bend a rod or he's going to wind up wiping out a rod bearing. It's going to move. The failure mode moves. It's like a fuse, and I've said it before. It's like a guy with a, you know, a breaker that keeps tripping in his house, and there's obviously something that's shorted the ground. And instead of actually addressing the problem, he goes and he slaps a 100-amp breaker in the thing. Next thing you know, the fire department's there, and the insurance company's going, well, what happened, Mr. Jones? I said, I don't know. I just put a bigger breaker in. Well, that's the reason why. There is a reason for everything to fail. We just It's trying to tell us what's going on with this thing. We just need to pay attention to it. And so that understanding what that part's saying, it's telling me, help. This is the hottest part of the cylinder. Somebody help me. And yet we, we're not paying attention to it. The injector spray pattern, you can tell spray pattern on that one, a little early. It's a little outside the bowl. So I can tell I'm, I'm looking at spray patterns. Every time I take one of those things out, I'm looking. The further out you start seeing that spray pattern, again, how you know this is it's like a shotgun, right? If we were to shoot it at a wall at 10 feet, we were to back up 20 feet, shoot it again. Spray pattern completely, it's a lot broader, right? Because we're further away. There's no difference in the relationship between the shotgun and the wall as there is between the injector and the piston itself. Because the piston is the wall, the injector is a shotgun. And the further we're getting out on that bowl, then that tells me we're spraying early. Because it hasn't, it's not getting a top dead center now. We're spraying. What you want is it to basically, you want to capture the heat inside the combustion bowl so that we can make a more efficient burn. They do this for a couple of reasons for emissions, but for time's sake, We'll stop at that, but that kind of gives you a little idea what's going on there. There's a lot more that can be said about this. You can make a whole topic about this, but anyway, that's a brief description. If you'll go to the next one, Cousin Vinny. So one of the things that you see right here is for scavenging. People ask all the time, what's the reason for these things? So you notice that they didn't put it between the intakes. They just put it between the exhaust and the one intake. Why would they do that? Well, there's a good reason. Cummins is not a stupid company. They're very... They're very smart. They do some dumb things every once in a while, but everybody has, you know, sometimes those are driven for other reasons and it's not engineers. The reason for this is, is that this basically, it, uh, it encourages uh, scavenging. Um, it encourages basically as that valve is being lifted off its seat, uh, it starts to pull. Basically what we have at this point um, is it's designed so that we can uh, create as much volumetric efficiency with fresh air as we can. There's yet another reason, though, 
The other reason is, is that that reduces some of that area. If I can increase the volume, I'm going to decrease the pressure. Okay. If I can increase. So basically, Boyle's law states that uh, pressure and volume are inversely proportional. What that means is, is that if I'm creating a little more volume and I'm doing that because those two areas right there, I'm hogging out a little material. I've got a little more material. I'm going to lower my pressure. Now, the combined gas law states that if I lower my pressure, I'm going to lower my temperature. What they're doing is they're cooling that, that, that one side of that piston down just a little bit. That's the reason why you do that. So for scavenging and for temperature uh, conservation, basically. All right, next that's slide. A, that's a 2019, right? Uh, no. no. 13 and up. 13. Uh, this is back in 04, 04 and a half to 07. Um, this was a really, really common problem. We kind of, you know, nothing. So the problem with it is, is this. You know, you saw you that really wide combustion bowl. The issue is, is that they were spraying so far out on that bowl. And then they added post injection because this was, remember, 04 and a half to 07. That was pre-EGR days. So we were doing everything we could uh, to try to drive the nitrogen oxide levels, which happened to be the auto ignition temperature of about 730 degrees. But anyway, the post-injection events that, and also the reversion of the camshaft was different on the profile. Um, and it was causing, um, like I said, the post spread, again, the post-injection event was causing ring compaction because of basic wall infringement of the injector spray. What, all is that, what does that all mean? Well, it just goes back to what we said a minute ago. Um, the further away you are with a piston, you're probably not going to hit the target. And so what happens is it starts building up carbon. Interestingly enough, Cummins started doing something where they're putting scrapers on the side of the wall that is, is actually scraping. Now, they're not doing that on a 6.7, but they're doing that on some uh, heavier duty applications. And that scrapes the tops of the piston uh, to keep that carbon down. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that, but nothing really applicable here. But if you look down at the where the broken ring is, you can see that it's, it's razor sharp. You could shave with it then. Um, and the reason for it is it wears the ring lamp out and it starts rocking in, in the ring and it's groove and uh, you get high amounts of blow by. Everybody that's worked on those things pretty know, pretty much knows uh, what's going on with that. Okay, next. This is another thing that we see. And this is a really something that, you know, you guys listening and watching need to really pay attention to. Um, your engine remanufacturer or whoever you're getting to do it, your machine shop, whatever. If they're not torque plate honing, and I had somebody comment on something this other day. I meant to tell you, Adam, I think I, I responded to it. The guy goes, well, the OE doesn't do it. Actually, the OE does torque plate honing uh, on the 5.9 Cummins and 6.7. It is a, it's it's from the factory. It's one of the processes that they do. Well, guys are going to argue with this all the time. They're always going to say, you don't need torque plate honing. You don't need torque plate honing. I always find it very interesting that the people that are always saying you don't need torque plate honing are also the people that are the same ones that say they don't have one. Um, it's almost kind of like the person that, you know, is for abortion is always one that is living. I've never, it's kind of funny how that works. But what happens is if you look back on that shaded area, um, and as you play through it again, if you pause it at the shaded area. So what we're looking at here is stop right there if you can. All right. So what we're looking at is, is the torque plate as it's placed on the block. It simulates the load as you're torquing this thing down of the cylinder head. If you hone it without the cylinder head and you hone it without the torque plate, then what is just mind boggling. And I remember the day that I thought, I, I could not believe that a big old piece of cast iron would be subject to torquing and twisting and uh, different, you know, this material could be moved that easy. I mean, it's a big, heavy 400 pound, 350 pound block of material. How could it distort that easy? Well, you start doing some testing on these things, you'll find out. There's a reason why your high performing teams We'll bolt uh, torque plates on. They'll bolt engine mount, any accessory they can when they hone this thing. That distorts the block immensely. That causes uh, uh, all kinds of uh, twisting effects. So what you're seeing right now is with this thing torque plate hone, that crosshatch you see up at the top and at the bottom, it's totally crosshatched, but there's one area that's shaded completely. Now the boring bar, bar caught it, but the hone didn't. Well, it's because when you... Uh, torque plate honed it, it distorts that bore because when you put a cylinder head on, it distorts the bore from what it was in a static position. So if we didn't do that, that distortion is about two, about one and a half, two thousandths. That equates to um, tremendous amounts 
and there's no way to put a flat number on this because it can be, it can be, I've seen guys pick up, I've seen guys pick up three digits on horsepower based off of their surface finish and based off of torque plate hunt. And it, they did nothing different, but just, just that. So now that block will be home to size and then we leave enough material so that we can take this out. But that's the importance of torque plate honing. So if you have engines that are consuming oil after a, new, a remanufactured engine, that's typically the biggest problem with it is when guys are doing these remanufactured processes, they're not doing this and that will cause oil consumption. Yep. Uh, big problem almost, uh, the six sevens. I mean, not spend too much time on this, but, and we have a fix for it. There's uh, other companies out there, but um, anyways, the intake grid heater, obviously the bolts get hot. Um, right where it's attached. Typically what happens is, is that uh, it's not the fastener on that thing um, is there's so much current that's going through it that it, it winds up displacing and is, is this no longer contact. It's, it's like arcing effect basically is what happens. You can tell from that it begins an arcing effect um, and eventually the head of the, uh, the nut will fall off. And well, if you look at the other side of the piston there, you can see uh, the effects of that. So, I mean, just, it's a bad day. Uh, that, that engine is in for a major teardown, and a major repair at the very least. So not much to say about that one. I had a, I had a quick question for you, Cass on the, uh, we're talking about the, the heads, the pistons, all those sorts of things you had mentioned, or, or I understand the heat part of it. And I think how many truck enthusiasts have a tuned truck. Do you ever see these issues on bone stock trucks or is it like nine out of 10 times it's something that's tuned so tuning is the number one reason for premature engine failure i would say okay uh poor tuning let me say that do you see it on stock trucks yes is it as common no but here's the other um factor of that heat and pressure are the only two things really for the most part that, that kill uh, anything cylinder related keep in mind when your diesel particulate filter stopped up you're creating tremendous amounts of drive pressure in terms of not just in the pressure itself, but in the heat that's being backed up. Things going through excessive regen. There's a lot of things going on with that. And because of that, yes, they, they definitely can fail. Um, I'll tell you this, though. The ones that I see it the most on uh, that are factory would probably be, um, well, it's hard to say. You know, I've seen, you know, six fours you know pop pistons that are factory tuned um and i've definitely seen other ones do that but it's it's certainly it's it's the minority by a lot i can see how with the topic of heat i know that the five nines have some issues which you went through you know with the slides but with the dpf the egrs and how those have progressed and the heat that they need to be able to do the regens and the different things that they do how that can become even more of an issue because of how hot they're running, just the way they're designed. Yeah. Yeah. A matter of fact, uh, the new S13 International is the first, I think, don't, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think this since uh, the mission days on the, uh, they're introducing a new engine international just announced. Um, I've kind of looked into it just a little bit, but it's a 13 liter that has no EGR. Um, so that's kind of a weird change, but everything, if you look at the, the diesel particulate filter on this thing, the, sl the SER. Um, I mean, it's golly, that thing's like three feet deep. It looks like and two feet wide. It's a monster. Um, it's extremely complex um, diesel particulate filter. But yeah, it's definitely introduced some failures that that would not have normally been there. But um, I would say, unfortunately, and I, I don't get me wrong, I'm a performance guy. I love performance engines and everything about it. But I have to be honest when I say that I've seen more cause of engine failures. And by all means, I know I get bashed on this. I'm not saying that uh, you don't tune, um, you know, tune a truck. I'm not, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying, again, I've kind of said this before in the past. Um, the problem with it is, is the vast majority of tuners don't have any way to quantify the changes that they're making other than the photometer. That's your butt in the seat. Okay. And that skinny pedal makes it go faster. Um, they don't know what's happening with cylinder pressures. Uh, they don't know really what's happening as far as a flame front. To give it, put it in perspective, um, Mala, uh, and I'm actually be going to Muskegon, their lab. Uh, we're working with them on some different things. And actually Oak Ridge, where they developed the atomic bomb, 
we're doing some uh, testing with them on some uh, combustion analysis. Uh, but they have instrumentation to pick up all of that information on what's going on on the piston. Um, they can actually tell you the different pressure points and they instrument the piston so that they can tell you the hot spots of the piston, the areas of higher pressures. They can tell you um, just tremendous amounts of data uh, based off of uh, these reports that they're doing. And I don't know anybody, honestly, um, really too many guys out there that, that have that kind of data in the aftermarket. That's that's the problem that we really run into. Can I, uh, can I yeah. tease this? Am I allowed to tease it? Sure. You know where I'm going here? Uh, a lot of this is related to the dimpling of the pistons, the golf ball pistons. This is the they found out some really interesting stuff. That, another conversation altogether, but it's 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 really interesting to hear what they found. Yeah, yeah. It's always interesting how um, you know everything needs to be tested the same, to be as scientific as we possibly can on anything that we do. Um, it's really important to make sure you know everything has to be done. Um, you know, garbage in, garbage out kind of thing. Input output. Um, it really has to be. Uh, you can get what you know. It's. I'll just say that it's extremely important that that. The inputs are going to, they're going to, they are going to uh, affect your outputs, you know, in the way that we do that. Anyway, next slide. Yeah, if you've got any questions, both of you guys, please jump in. I know people get tired. Uh, this is really simple, easy, low proof freeze plugs, um, I guess. So this presentation, in all fairness, um, was given uh, last week for the Production Engine Rebuilders Association. And that's where a bunch of the P so what a PER is, is you have to manufacture a minimum of 500 engines a year. Um, so I get invited down there. It seems like uh, this is my third year in a row to, to talk about some of the problems, uh, how to drive down warranties and, and how to improve different products and things like that. Um, and obviously those guys are production engineer builders. So they're not going to, uh, they're not going to probably adopt some of the things that we do because it just takes too much time to do it. Um, but we talk about it and there's a lot of things that they can do. So, uh, anyway, this is one of them. So anyway, all our engines come standard with this, because if we have a problem with something, we're not going to do it the same way tomorrow, tomorrow that we did today, we're going to change it. If we know there's an issue with whatever it is, whether it's an OE problem, our problem, whatever. Go ahead. Seven, three now too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I, yeah, I missed what you were saying. Yeah, so the 7.3, not to jump off on that topic, but one of the things that we did some testing on we found is that your 7.3s for the Ford guys out there so that they don't feel like they're left out. I can talk about your problems, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, so what happens is, is the sidewall on the on the 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 block itself is thin. I mean, it's just a four, basically the 444 was a – or the 7.3 liter, whatever you want to call it. The sidewall, uh, and I'm talking about the castings where the engine mounts are, they are pretty thin. And what happens is you'll see more problems come from blown freeze plugs. And I know this because we fought this. Blown freeze plugs, and it always blows out of the same one. Every stinking time, it seems like. Um, if it's going to blow most often, it'll wind up blowing right there by the engine mount. Okay, well, this ties in with what, you're what we're talking about with the uh, torque plate honing, where people go, there's no way a casting can move that much. Absolutely it can. If you do it long enough, you will find out anybody in this world that does what we do. Oh, maybe. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It sure will. But what happens is the engine mount, where it's mounted, um, is right below the freeze plug. And when a guy takes off at a red light, you have that torque effect, right? It's happening. So it's pulling down on the block. So there's about a 12 to 15 foul press fit on a freeze plug. And what happens is, is it pulls down. And a lot of times, you know, after a block's been manufactured or if, or if you're, you've ever had a plug out. I mean, it's it's going to happen. You've got sediment and stuff around little areas and different things like that. Well, sometimes they'll slightly, you know, change the geometry a little bit. When it when it torques over, it loosens that press just enough and it will wind up sometimes blowing out that plug. doesn't matter. You can put Indian head number nine on it. You can put a, an anaerobic on it. You can put Loctite on it. You can, you know, you can get your little brother to hold his finger there while it's going down the road. It doesn't matter. It's going to come out. And the best way to fix that, once we find a problem, we're going to fix it. Um, so what we do is all of our 7.3s now come standard with billet freeze plugs with high bars. They can't come out. It's impossible. Um, and they look really nice, but, you know, most forward stuff, you can't see it after you put it in there anyway. So 
but it's cool in the you know when you get it. <laughs> Next slide. Sure. Um, yeah, this again goes back to some of the uh, installation issues that you know guys were having for the PERs. Um, you know, guys, I've seen them run some aftermarket coolers that are out there. They're a five layer cooler instead of the eight layer cooler. Um, so the 4BT came with a five layer, but sometimes guys are actually getting there's companies out there that are selling stuff, mismatching stuff, and you're not, you're running oil temperatures that are higher than what they should be. And it's because that oil cooler is not the, uh, not necessarily the right one for your application. So it's something to be cognizant of, especially for the installers. We see tons and tons of, it, you know, different scenarios and things like that. And, and just want to bring that to guys' attention. Ah, so this one is pretty cool. Interesting problem here. Um, so, I see more of these things laying in the floor of shops all the time. Guys get done installing these things and these brackets that they, you know, they just decided to just, you know, I don't know why they they didn't have them on the six on the five nine Cummins, but now they got them on the six seven. Why do we need to put these brackets back? Well, there's a really good reason for this, and the reason for it happens to be uh, the polar moment of inertia. What all does polar moment of inertia mean? Basically. Uh, what happens is, is it's distorting the back cylinder. Now, you know, obviously Cummins gets a wrap for running the, the back cylinder running a little hotter than the other cylinders and different things like that. Don't disagree with that. I'm saying that a lot of times things get blamed because it just seems like it's like somebody told me um, uh, last week, a really good friend of mine who is uh, he runs a, a balancing company, crankshaft uh, balancing company and they balance all kinds of stuff. He makes the, the machine for it. And he said uh, in uh, in our industry, if you don't understand something and it's causing a failure, we call it harmonics. I mean, it's just the name you put on it and send it, right? Um, and I think a lot of times things get tagged as the as the wrong uh, diagnosis, or there's more to the story. Again, I'm not disputing that there's a there's a basically a, a that cylinder's running hotter in the background, but here's the reason why. So first, let me say this: Why do you put brackets on those and not on the five nine? Okay. Uh, go to the next slide. I think I can make it easier to understand this. <laughs> so we play this video. What you see is a sign just absolutely whipping in the wind to beat the band. Well, what does that actually have to do with what we're talking about? Well, this is a great representation of polar moment of inertia. Basically, what that means is, is it's the ability to withstand a torsional load in a certain axis so if we take the stop sign and the stop sign is the crankshaft, okay, the block or the cylinder wall would be the post and the ground that's holding all that up would be the wheels on the, the truck. Okay. So how can we make that thing twist more? Okay. There's a, three different ways that I can think of. Uh, one, we can put a bigger stop sign on. Okay. If we had a bigger stop sign, there'd be more force acting on this. Okay, great. Now, what does that have to do with what we're talking about? A 6.7 Cummins has a larger, um, it basically has a, um, uh, um, uh, a larger stroke, which increases uh, the mechanical load that is being applied to the crankshaft. You have, a, you have a mechanical advantage at that point. So there's more torsion that we're seeing from that which would equate to basically what I'm trying to do is liken it to the stop sign here. Because now that we have a greater moment or uh, a longer arm, <clears throat> uh, then now we have more torsional load that's, that's having an effect on the engine. Now, what is it having an effect on? Well, we said that the post was a cylinder wall. All right. So there's three things that we can do to put more force on that post. One is, is like I said, we can increase the radius. So if we increase the radius of the sign, we increase the basically the radius of the stroke that we're talking about. Now we're having more torsional load, which the 6.7, like I said, it's greater than the 5.9. The other thing is the force that we're applying. Okay. So if we increase the torque of the engine, we're going to have more twisting effect that's going on towards the back of the block. That's what we're really talking about is the back cylinders, where your rear adapter is bolted to the back of that block. OK, so longer radius, more torsion, more force, again, more torsion. The third thing would be the angle at which 
the uh, air, the uh, wind is, is blowing the sun. Okay, so how does that affect it again? That goes back to what we're talking about, the mechanical load of the crankshaft based off of the, um, uh, the rod stroke there. So um, that being said, Cummins came out with a way to combat that, and that is uh, through bracing. So what we're seeing is, is when that in engine is again in the truck, there's this twisting force that's playing. There's a lot of forces that are acting on an engine that people don't realize. I mean, that engine's actually, if you took that engine, you hung it um, from a um, uh, from a gantry crane or something, and you started the engine up, it's going to want to start turning itself around. It's basically trying to go in a circle the whole time. Why would that be? Well, that's called gyroscopic precession. Those are forces that are actually acting on that crankshaft the entire time this engine's running. It's like a bicycle. You've seen uh, guys take bicycles. You know, you spin it and you hold the hold the the spindle out, and then you go to try to turn it. If you were sitting on a seat, this thing would turn you around, right? You could do this. That's called gyroscopic precession. Basically, ninety degrees of the direct direction of rotation means that's the force that's being applied to it. The reason for the bracing, again, is that back cylinder wall is being twisted, again, by the torsional load that's being placed on the uh, the truck each time you go to take off at a stop sign or each time that you go to accelerate hard, it's going to twist that cylinder. If we can brace that, then what we're able to do is give a little bit of structural uh, rigidity to the cylinder wall. We can decrease some of the, the wear and also the ring stick. So that's what polar moment of inertia effects are. Basically, like I said, it's a capacity for something to be able to withstand a torsional load in a certain axis. I think that's, uh, and then at some point in time, they yield. Next slide. <laughs> I don't know if you got any volume on that or not. This lady uh, doesn't know it yet, but she's having a bad day with the wind blowing. I think I've seen this one before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then there's the yielding of the stop sign, right? So it's uh, it definitely is a real thing to combat. It's a real problem. Um, so the bracing is there for a reason. There's a reason why Cummins spent as much money as they did to manufacture that part. Uh, and it's not just for looks. It's helpful to see all these slides and then hear the explanations behind it is typically <clears throat> we'll hear about just the failures or the things after the fact and it always seems as just a casual observer like they're chasing the problem they don't know where it came from and then you're just throwing parts at it not understanding it so being able to see these things is incredibly helpful to understand why yeah. six sevens might have issues or even some of the other engines that you went through right yeah, it's really a difficult thing to try to explain this without having some type of visual aid because it's just, I couldn't grasp it. My mind uh, couldn't grasp it. But it's important, like I said, it's important to understand and to grasp the understanding of, you know, um, everything happens. <laughs> everything happens for a reason. Sounds like that'll preach or something, but everything happens for a reason. Um, and it is important with engines to know there is a, there's a reason for this thing failing. We just need to listen to them. I think it becomes even more important with the upgrades that a lot of truck owners will do over the years that they own something. That's where it starts to compound itself. And that's where my interest is really drawn to is, okay, maybe I'm going to tune it. Maybe I'm going to do different injectors, different turbo. Maybe I'm going to do these other things where I want to, I want to know before I do it, what I'm getting into and where I may have some issues. So the problem is being an engine builder and I would not, if you uh, value your sanity, um, I would not suggest this as an, you know, as a profession. And the reason why I say that is because you can't even install a bumper without affecting my engine. I mean, what are you talking about? You're crazy. You can't install a bumper without affecting. And I think, I mean, you talked about this before, um, but there was a, and it's interesting enough, um, the guy that used to work for me, he had a, just installed, he had like a 15 Cummins or something. And he put a certain bumper on there and goes up into the mountains pulling a camper. Next thing he knows, he's getting codes for intake air temperatures and just going crazy. And that's because the location of the intercooler was being blocked by uh, the, the bumper that he just installed. It was an aftermarket part. Nothing else changed. And 
how does that affect the engine? Well, obviously, mass air density is absolutely destroyed at that point in time because we're trying to compress something that's hot. And when you go and you compress uh, uh, something already that is already hot, we're just superheating this thing. Um, not to mention that we're destroying any performance that we would be able to have. But you can't put bigger tires on it without affecting the engine. I'm not saying don't do these things. I'm understand. I'm saying you need to understand what you're affecting. You, if you put a larger tire on this thing, how does it affect the engine? Well, what happens is, is now because we have increased the the angle of instance, the basically the angle of the uh, the the drive shaft. Now, what happens is, is, is now we have more axial load that's placed on the engine. So when you go to take off, how many how many times have you got seen guys, you know, or videos of guys snapping drive shafts? You know, this huge drive angle, right? What happens is, is that, or perfect example, the you see the rear end start to wrap, right? Well, it didn't do that until you started to, to crank on this thing. You started to increase it. It's pushing forward on the engine, okay? It's trying to push the engine basically through the front of the radiator. Well, there's something there. It's called a thrust bearing. And it's pushing on the thrust bearing the whole time. And it can wipe the thrust bearing out. It doesn't matter who manufactures it. It doesn't matter what happens because it, Basically, is dispersing the um, uh, the basically the the film uh, the oil film that's on that thrust bearing. It'll destroy it. Um, but there's just everything. The thing about it is, is this: everything is a system about an engine, about a truck. Really, it is a system. It's not a single. Uh, it's not a single component. Um, if this were um, basically a piece of furniture or something like a couch. It does not have any representation or any effect on the, uh, the love seat or, or the, the recliner, but this thing has to work together. All components have to work together in harmony or they become inharmonious. And that's failure mode. Number one. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, so yeah, let's talk a little bit about the new stuff. We talked about the, some old stuff. Um, but uh, there's a really hot topic that I've had a lot of people ask me about lately, and that is the uh, 2019 and up compacted graphite iron blocks. And uh, there's a lot to be said for this engine, um, and not in necessarily in a good way. There's a lot of problems that are out there with that thing, and, and uh, so we kind of dive into that here in a second. Um, but with this slide, you can kind of see a couple of things. The one on the left is the conventional 6.7, 18 and down. The one on the right is a 19 and up compacted graphite iron. Now to understand what compacted graphite iron block is, it's completely different in its its um, um, its makeup. It is a uh, block that's lighter. Um, it is a block that's stronger. And it is a block that in many ways is less dense and will absolutely uh, have more, not to go back to what I said, but it has more uh, frequency and harmonic issues that we're seeing over and over again because based off of the um, uh, the composition of the block, uh, the density of uh, the material, uh, it's it's completely, it, it reacts completely different than, than cast iron does. Anybody that's ever surfaced one of these blocks knows that uh, if you took a, a, a surface um uh, a uh, block cutter over the top, you would fight waviness off of one block versus the other a lot more. It'll wear the inserts out a lot more. There's a reason for it. This thing rings like a bell. But if you start looking at the, just the geometry of the block, the first thing you're going to notice uh, is that the blocks contoured to the cylinder wall. They have taken weight out every single place they could on this block. Um, they have um, They have looked at any area. They've actually pulled out 74 pounds of uh, weight last time I checked on the block alone, but um, that's that's came with a price tag. They've done that for a couple of reasons. Some of it's manufacturing costs. Um, some of it's is, is based off of um, uh, some engineering designing that uh, they thought that they could get away from. I think more. I really, I think it really boils down to it was just honestly, I think it was manufacturing costs more than anything else. I can't really think other than lighter fuel mileage possibly they could have picked up. But in doing so, you'll look, if you look at the water pump area, okay, on the one on the left, it's just kind of a, basically a prismatic shape, it's just kind of squared off. If you look at the one on the right, they've contoured the uh, impeller house of the water pump. They took weight out every single place they possibly could on this thing. 
and they didn't leave any. I mean, it almost looks like Honda got involved with Cummins and decided they were just going to take this thing and go take a carbon knife and go to it. So let's see kind of where else they took this thing out. Now you're seeing on the top side. Let's look at the bottom side and see. I don't even know what slide's coming next, but we'll just plan on. Okay. Well, here, right. let, me, let me go to go to the bottom side. How's that? And then okay, there you go. Yeah, that's good. All right. So if you look, there's windows everywhere on the main saddle. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a problem. Okay, so we took weight out. That is not, and if you look on the left side, on the main saddle, there's a gaping hole right there, round oval. You see that? Right down below the bearing, where the bearing would sit. If you go down below it, there's a hole right through the main saddle. On the right hand, they've windowed the one on, uh, on the side. So what we have done now is we've created a problem and a big one, and it's sitting right in front of your face. If you, and I wish I had a pointer or something that I could zoom in. It shows up pretty well. Uh, yeah, I don't know if the guys on the screen can see. It's yeah. A, You've got my point. All right. Okay. Look at the fretting area. You should know. Yeah, that is the windows, right? So if we're looking at that right where the bolt hole is, don't, no, 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 go back. All right. So where the bolt hole is for your main cap, you see it where it's shiny and you can see that etching of where the yeah. main cap was. Yeah. yeah, that's it. That's called fretting. What's happening is, is the main cap is actually displacing like this. Okay. So it's moving the whole time when it gets under uh, load. It actually distorts it, and it you can see the same thing on the bearing surface right there. You can see etching, and you see some line marks in the back, but there's etching that's going on so that the bearing is actually moving on this thing as well. So they lighten it up so much that now that they're having structural integrity issues out of the bottom end of this engine. So big problem is, and to prove my point on this, Cummins is going to say, and I, I mean, I, the more I get into this thing, the more I'm going to have to eventually one day I'm just going to keep my mouth shut about this because I'm sure my phone's going to ring. It's going to be one of these OEs on, on my <laughs> doorstep. But you guys are getting you're getting the real story of this. They know there's a problem, and they if anytime you want to know if they really know there's a problem or not, just watch technical support bulletins. Uh, next slide, is it there? Can you go and find my TSB? Writing. But... Okay, wait a minute. Back up just a second. Okay. So that some folks might say, well, that's just on one main cap. No, it's not. Look at that main cap on the left picture. And actually, you can see it on the right picture. Every single one of these caps are fretting. Like I said, they're doing this. They're giving this motion. Okay. So it's not like there's, an, you know, this is uh, 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 something that's uh, rare and we're only seeing it on one cap. And it's kind of a um, just an exception to the rule. This is common. Go ahead and go to the next slide. There's your etching, or excuse me, your fretting that you're seeing from the bearing. You see, it looks like it's um, it's almost like it's um, causing um, a uh, burnishing effect um, towards the right side. I again, I don't have control of the corner, but you, you, if you look at the picture, you'll see it. It's pretty pretty obvious there. The back side of that bearing is actually etching and, and moving around. Um, and I'll show you what the temperatures are. That it actually micro welding is what basically winds up happening because you're seeing this frictional. Um, this this movement causes friction and it causes the bearing to get very very hot and it'll wind up starting to uh, to micro welding it takes place about thirteen hundred degrees somewhere like that and that's how hot it's actually getting between surfaces. Go ahead and so here is our TSB. I love it. This is so funny. I like it because it's well. Let's just read it. The powertrain control module on about uh, thirty four thousand above vehicles. It says may have calibration software that does not provide adequate engine warm up protection. Inadequate warm up protection can cause lack of oil film on the rod bearings while the engine is reaching operating temperature, resulting in engine damage and potential connecting rod failure, which may puncture the block and result in oil contacting a competent ignition source and a vehicle fire may occur. A vehicle fire may risk or may, uh, may increase the risk of injury to occupants and persons outside the, the vehicle, as well as property damage. Like, you don't know. I mean, it's kind of, I always thought that's kind of humorous. It's like, it may puncture the block. <laughs> well, yeah, we call that a bad day. Um, the interesting part about it is, is they're going to fix this problem, and they're going to do it through flashing your ECM. And that's going to make all your problems go away. You know, like I say all the time, your golf swing will get better. Your truck's going to get better fuel mileage. Your marriage is going to improve. Life's going to be great. So all you need is a reflash. There's a big issue. Reflashing is not going to fix this problem. That fretting did not occur on startup. I can assure you, if the main caps are moving at the 
700 RPM, right now they are coming completely out of the vehicle when you put a load under it. But did you notice what they said the problem was? It said the effect of the problem was the rod bearings. Specifically, that's interesting. Well, we'll find that in a, a minute in a slide. And I know that if I don't cover this in just the quickest, uh, and I'm going to skim over the top of it because the you go back to the other slide, we talk about camshaft failures. Because there's companies out there that are, you know, they've got aftermarket stuff for cams and, and different things like that. The problem with it is, is that the big thousand pound gorilla in the room um, is not the cam, even though it seem, seemingly might be. Keep going back. There's a lifter failure on this thing. Um, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Right there. Okay. Um, you can go back one more. We'll talk about the thing. Scissor gear on this. All right. So this was introduced, I think, 2020 is the first time I've seen it. Um, the reason for this. Okay. We talked about this a little bit. Why did they go to a, a roller lifter on this? The reason for it is, is because it was lobbied for the NBH or the noise, vibration, and harshness from the EPA. Um, is basically, as we understand it, that's just the reason why they were planning about the noise of the Cummins engine. Uh, that they had to do something about that. And the problem with that is, is that they went from the flat tap at lifter, which was proven, tried and true, and never really had any issues. Everybody, I mean, how many times have you heard guys talk about lifter failure, camshaft failure off the Cummins? Not very often, pretty rare. But then they went to the uh, roller lifter, and now they have a uh, hydraulic roller in this thing, and it's causing all kinds of failures. So let's go to the next slide, and we'll start seeing some of the things that we're going to and I'm not going to say because I have not had this engine on a CMM yet, um, but you can start seeing side loading. The wear pattern on that lifter bore, or excuse me, on the lifter body itself, almost looks as though the geometry of it's off. Like there's a no, there's some perpendicularity issues between the cam bore housing and the lifter bore housing. I can't tell that for 100% certainty. We're obviously we're seeing a lot of failures out of the tabs on this thing. What happens is is that the axle where the uh, uh, the uh, it, it is supported by the tabs on the lifter body. They're breaking and failing. Um, and again, that looks like a side loading issue. Um, but again, it really doesn't matter because I don't even care at this point because I've got, even if I fix that problem, I've got bigger issues. And those issues, all right, let's go. Those issues are like we talked about, the fretting. So something that's interesting about this is how could fretting from a main cap cause a rod bearing issue? All right, I'm trying to wrap my head around that. How is that even possible? Well, this hydrodynamic film uh, image, this little um, uh, graphic that we have here, is basically showing the rotation of the crankshaft and how it works. And it works basically, it's very similar. It's kind of like a, a uh, it always, to me, it kind of reminds me of a, a gear rotor pump, right? So we have an eccentric that we're basically compressing that oil. So as it comes, uh, as oil enters the bearing outer surface area, right, it's being pulled around. The force that you're, the load that you're seeing right now, uh, you can see the red arrows showing this is the force that's acting downward on the crankshaft. But as it's pulling this, this oil around, it basically acts just like a skier on the water, right? So what it's doing is uh, you, you as, as this uh, hydrodynamic wedge is, uh, uh, being introduced into um, whichever surface, whether it's cam or rod or, or main, whatever, it picks up on the item that it's or the component that it's supporting. And by doing so, uh, obviously, it's keeping the, the, that off the bearing. Go to the next slide because we want to talk about what's happening here. This is it. OK, so this is a, from Mall and uh, I've worked with their, you know, when they're engineers here, we were talking about this just the other day. So the one on the left is actually correct. That's the the way that what you're seeing is is that the, is the, the crankshaft is is rotating about its bore. The clearance space um, is even on the one on the right. It's being squeezed all the way around, and it's actually wiping uh, the bearing journal. The one on the left isn't going into an orbit. It's staying somewhat centered based off that hydrodynamic wedge. So when we start having these fretting issues, and we have things that are introducing um, some of the um, um, effects and whipping on the crankshaft uh, and some of the imbalances based off of, um, um, and what I'm saying is, 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 is not necessarily just an imbalance, but basically um, um, an uncontrolled movement of the crankshaft for whatever reason. It affects the bearing or, or the oil film uh, for the, the bearing and for the crankshaft journal. And that's what you're seeing on the, uh, 
uh, the the image on the right. So it's um, creating a uh, a wiping effect basically for the oil. Go to the next slide and we'll kind of look at this just a second. All right, so you can see from uh, this, it, basically from that wiping effect, what we're seeing on the right side is about seven tenths, I think, uh, and I don't have that information in front of me. Um, I think the one on the left is, is nine tenths um, oil film, basically that's, that is basically breaking that, uh, uh, that hydrodynamic wedge down. And you start having peak pressures because of this. So we have uh, go to the next slide just a second, and I can show you on this. As it there we go. That's the the seven tenths that I was talking about, and the other one I think the camera's behind that. Yeah. Okay. So here's what's happening. We have a peak pressure. Go to the go to the next slide just one second. We'll see if it's on. Go to the next slide after that, and I'm gonna have to come back. Okay. Uh, one more. Okay, well, all right, let's look at this slide here. So as that crankshaft is moving, uh, and there's an image on this, uh, I don't know if it plays or not, but it shows an elongation, there it is. It's an elongation, basically, of the journal housing bore. Now, I'm going to make this real short and sweet on, uh, for this. What's actually happening, go back to that, the other slide real quick. As the crankshaft is moving around, we have, we're having peak oil pressure. So we're going in at 50 pounds of pressure right in the in the journal bore itself but as this elongation is occurring it's introducing air into the bearing housing it can't it so it can compress the oxygen and as it's coming through its eccentric it's forcing the oil back in the way that it came and it's it's achieving pressures as high as 31,000 pounds of pressure so basically it's deadheading the system well the next bearing that is supposed to be getting oil is the rod bearing so it's the elongation that's causing the aeration, right? Or the the um, uh, uh, the allowance for that to happen, and then it pressurizes the existing uh, the oil and the oxygen that's in that, and it deadheads that, and it starves everything else out. And what you see is, is if you look at the failure mode, of the bearing at the very bottom, you notice that if you look, you can see that on the the bearing itself, the bottom looks fine. But it's the sides that don't look good. The reason why is it's basically taking that oil, like you had water on a table, and smash it. What happens? It disperses that oil really, really quickly to the uh, outwardly. Well, what happens is, is, like I do, it's slamming that crankshaft down under that oil film, and it's dispersing the oil on both sides of that bearing. And that's the reason why you're having, it's not actually where the um, impact's taking place that's, it's, it's delayed. You're seeing it on, uh, well, at this point, the, on the right and on the left. So it's interesting to note that the pressure is being introduced, like I said, because of the in inability to capture the crankshaft. And that's what's introducing all these problems for the rod bearings on the 6.7 Cummins, the new one that's coming out. It has nothing to do, in my opinion at all, with uh, a reflashing of an ECM or a warm-up cycle this damage has occurred not at not at startup these these problems that these guys are having are not at startup they're happening under load and you're seeing the effects of it i gotta ask you a question i gotta ask you a question real quick Cass. sorry to interrupt you adam <clears throat> i want to make sure i understand this so it, it's kind of mind-blowing to go through all this and think about it is this the weakest engine in this engine family like in this this lineup because to me it's jumping out and saying yes it's changing my opinion of a whole year range of trucks here's the issue that i have the biggest problem i got is i, I what we're doing to fix this is actually um changing the blocks and we're making some parts so that we can backwards make something backwards compatible there's really not a good fix i can't manufacture a part to fix that block because there's no material there. Though you saw the windowed mains on either side. You saw the window at the 12, you know, at the six o'clock position in that picture that we were looking at. There's others that can do a much better job than I have of explaining that. But nonetheless, it is uh, it is it is the issue, and it, there's really not a fix in sight for that because of the amount of material that was removed from that block, which stinks because I'm a big Cummins fan. 
but what do you do? Yeah. yeah I, I've had questions to over the you know last two or three years to talk about this. And I just didn't understand the major issue it was because I, I think back to my interest in Cummins and I got into it right when they went to the six sevens. And I kind of remember the talk about, I think at the dealerships, they had uh, like a billboard when you'd walk in and it would tell you how many parts it had in common with a five nine. So you're like, Oh cool. I'm just getting a bigger five nine. And then we started to learn the issues with it. And then this is like totally different. And I, I, the, the slides just help so much seeing these things and it's just, it would change potentially my decision to buy one. And I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Um, I know that when we first got on this, this thing, I, I mean, slides were, you know, um, I probably had a little apprehension about having slides on this because I know it's a podcast, but I just don't know any other way than showing you guys what's going on. So, it, and it's a lot to cover. I mean, really, and that was the short version of it. I know that was a lot, but I'm thinking to myself, golly, I know I'm boring some people out there, but I mean, it's really, this is content that I don't, have you ever heard anybody talk about this stuff? Because no. I haven't. And until I got involved with some of the testing that I'm doing, some of this stuff was just quite frankly, I never would have equated the failure of the rod with an elongated, basically, like I said, uh, an uncapturable uh, bearing housing that you just can't control this thing uh, because there's not enough material there to control it. There's not enough. And so one of the things is, is that people go, okay, well, what we need to do is put main studs down the bottom. That's going to fix the problem. Here's the issue with putting main studs. If you don't have enough structure down there to support it and you clamp this thing down, you're going to destroy the bore housing and you're still, at the end of the day, you're not being able to control it. Because again, and uh, there again, um, you wind up putting, uh, basically someone's holding the rope for you as you're going down the well, but they're not strong enough to hold the rope. It doesn't really matter, right? So you're putting this big stud in in hopes that they're going to be able to hold it, but you're attaching it to something that's just not physically capable of, of doing. It. It's not an issue with a fastener. If it were an issue of a fastener, you would start seeing other failure modes in different areas of that cap. But this isn't a walking issue. Okay, and that's the key. It's not a walking issue. It's actually um, almost like an accordion that's happening so that it's causing an, an oval shape to that bearing housing. So if it were possibly walking that way, I could say, yeah, you might be able to do something with fasteners. And then somebody else is going to come out and go, okay, what about billet main caps? Trust me, guys. I mean, I'm out there. I want to sell you parts. I want to make stuff for this stuff. Um, the problem with it is, is it's not the billet main cap that's the issue. That's not where... The tension load is it's bolted down to the block so your clamping force is applied here but it's getting its strength from where it's screwed into right so the main cap's not going to fix your problem this is changing my whole way of looking at the aftermarket because i mentioned that the six sevens and five nines like i it doesn't matter what engine it is like we've talked about it before cast the six fours how you can how you can fix them the six liters seven threes duramaxes we can go through all of those and there was always a solution might have taken some time but there was something we could do with pistons freeze plugs piston rings heads valve seats all that sort of stuff well now i'm having this foundation that is inherently flawed what are we going to throw it's still going to be inherently flawed and i think especially as these trucks come out of warranty and especially as the aftermarket progresses with some of the other parts people are going to start throwing more power at them they're going to try to do things with them and they're going to run into these issues. So it's just a major, I don't want to say red flag, but it kind of is like you know, people listen, they watch you guys, they call you guys, they, they pay attention to YouTube and social media and they look to that to be able to decide, Hey, what am I going to do with this truck in the future? I, I can't think of an engine. You would know better than me. that has this inherent flaw. That's so big. It's going to affect the future of it from a, reliability longevity standpoint power standpoint is, it, is there anything Cousins, similar to it you know cummins hasn't had an issue and it, it it wasn't this big but the code the code 53 block was cracking yeah right um yeah i mean but they some of those were warranted some of those went two hundred thousand miles never had failure and you know you're always going to get the guy going well i've had my six seven uh cummins 2020 and i've got three hundred thousand miles on it which you do but it does not mean <laughs> It's, it's not the one that's the it, that's the exception. I'm not telling you that every single one of them are, are there, but I'm telling you that if you add any power to this thing, uh, it's going to end up having more. You are 
it, it, the, you saw it yourself, the bottom end. And that the fact that they're putting this TSD out there, they're admitting to it. They know there's an issue. It's not like I'm coming up with this thing just to have something to talk about. I promise you, that's not the case. There's an issue. I'm, obviously, we're seeing it, and we're seeing it from all sides. So, you know, it definitely is going to affect that market. They, they're going to have to do something different with that block. But can you imagine the amount of money that's invested? Yeah. I mean, and I know now on firsthand experience, going through a design phase, uh, a good friend of mine owns um, um, Blueprint Engines, um, Norris Marshall, and they have a bunch of gas burner stuff. Uh, and I've toured their facility. And to get something through the design phase, you want to make sure you didn't screw up anything because you're fixing a manufacturer. Tons of these, you're buying tooling and you're buying, you know, the, the dies and the cast to do this uh, procedure is is going to uh, buy uh, cost a tremendous amount of money. There's a ton of money that Cummins put into this thing, and now they got to pull the plug on it and say, "Nope." You think they're going to do that? Probably not. Not for a while. There's a couple friends I had were having a conversation. They both have newer trucks, and one bought a six seven because he wanted the CP three. The other one had a power stroke, and he's like, "I don't got to deal with CP4 failure." So after this, I've got to got to share some bad news about this engine block with him. When, and, I, uh, <laughs> when I got done with the presentation at PRA, I had two guys or three guys come up to me and go, "Well, thanks a lot. I'm going home. I'm selling the truck." Okay. Sorry, I'm like not the guy you want to talk to and ask, "Hey, what would you buy?" I can tell you what I would buy, but I'm not going to tell you on this podcast because I'm only going to be hated by the people that are hardcore, diehard, <laughs> you know, Cummins guys. Honestly, I would buy the thing that I find would be the most reliable. And yeah. there are some trucks out there that everything has its quirk. But again, like you said, uh, what it boils down to is what is a fixable issue? I mean, I'm not going to point to any singular, you know, any single manufacturer and say, these guys are perfect. They've got it done. No, but there are a lot of other platforms out there that you can go, yeah, but you can do this and get by with it. This one's just, man, this is like I said, this is a thousand pound gorilla. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a big takeaway I have from it is it just changes the way that I think about it because there was always fixes. They might take a while uh, to come out, but once they did, you could have a reliable truck And this one. I'm just kind of stuck on right now, but it, it was incredibly helpful to have this conversation, to see those slides, to see what you're seeing building engines, to understand, Hey, these, these six sevens are different than all the other ones. And this is why. So people ask me all the time, what would you like for your company And when people think of show engineering? Besides a quality product, what are you kind of got guys known for? It's fixing the OE problems. I don't want, I want to be known as a guy that resolved the issues. You know, obviously your Ford engine, your GM engine, your Cummins engine, it failed. You don't want to go back with that. You want to do something better than that. That's, that's the whole mission statement of our company is to provide you with a better engine than what the OE provided and not just there's more engineering that goes, we're re-engineering this stuff and fixing it through manufacturing processes, through parts, through a lot of different ways. Um, but when it comes to this, it's really, it's disheartening for you guys, I know, but you've got one truck. I've got customers out here that I would love. Now, that being said, we are fixing this problem, but the way we're doing it is, is to, like I said, we're reverting back to, um, we've found what, what matches and, and what we can do and what we can manufacture parts for in order to, to, to make it work where it's backwards compatible because there's quite a bit of differences. Um, crankshafts, 10 bolt. Um, I'm not going to actually go through all of that, but there are quite a bit of differences um, between the, the two engines, but you get the reliability of the flat tap, you know, cam, you get away from that. You get the reliability that Cummins has always provided here to four um, when you're buying a chode engine. And I'm not, that's a shameless plug, but especially after giving you the news that you've got terminal cancer, you know, um, <laughs> But, um, but it's just the truth. I mean, you would want me to tell you, right? What's the best way for our listeners to be able to follow some of these updates and things you guys are coming out with? Because I'm sure you're, it's going to be a lot faster. You guys are going to have information on the website or on social media to be able to see it. Then, you know, maybe the next time we chat and I know people are really going to be curious and probably have tons of questions for you guys too. Adam is handles all that. Um, so I'm going to turn that over to him. So first and foremost, it goes up on YouTube or sorry, uh, Facebook and Instagram almost instantly as we find these things. Um, and then everything lives on YouTube. Um, really, if you want to 
find a bunch of info there. It's going to be on, on YouTube and you're not going to have to dig through a bunch of our sale posts and stuff like that. Although you should dig through our sale posts <laughs> on Facebook, but no, if you want just the info, um, YouTube's got the most uh, teachable info there. We, we cover a lot of uh, other platforms there for a while. Every week we're putting out a different platform, which we're going to get back to that. I'm just I'm doing a lot of traveling right now. I'm, I'm on, so I'm very involved in the community, in the industry, uh, Automotive Engine Rebuilders Association. I'm on the board now with them. I'm on the board now with DRA. And I get to work with some really cool people at some of the OE level. That's the reason why I get some of these slides. So that's kind of nice. So I get to work with... Uh, some of the guys that are designing some of the parts that are in the, you know, that are in these engines. So it makes it really, really cool to be kind of on the inside of some of these things and see kind of one of the things that are going on and share it with you guys. So we put out a lot of content. You know, the best consumer is an educated consumer. Uh, it makes my job so much easier. And if I can put out content that he's willing to do due diligence and actually not go on a Facebook forum and just go, Hey, what's the best engine to buy? You really need to, I mean, that's some of those things. It's just, it's not helpful. Trust me. It's not helpful. Um, do some digging, educate yourself, take the time. If it's worth it. Everybody wants a quick answer. They want to buy it from Amazon today and have it tomorrow. They want something quick. Do due diligence and do your own research and spend some time. You're spending money, spend time on this. Because at the end of the day, I don't know too many guys that drive trucks that don't want to know more about what they drive. Right. So that's the reason why we're doing it. We're not doing it necessarily to sell anything. Obviously, we want you to buy our engine, but it sure does make it a lot easier to sell you one when you go, oh, yeah, I do want that thing torque plate home because I saw your video on that, man. I, I don't want anything that's not torque plate home. That's terrible. Well, I definitely appreciate the time today and the information and giving us an inside look at some issues with these engines and helping us to think like you mentioned to be educated and think about it so Cass and Adam I appreciate you chatting with me today getting this info out to our audience which I know they're going to appreciate and look forward to chatting with you guys again don't forget diesel fans make sure and head on over to kershaw.kaiusa.com use code diesel 2023 for 20% off site wide it's a great way to save some money get some really cool gear if you need a knife or hunting fishing edc something around the house or at the job site they've definitely got you covered they've had a bunch of new releases in 2023 and one of the newest ones are the duralock models which the blades made out of d2 steel there's different choices for blade shape um, handle shape and the way that it opens and closes is super smooth i got a few of them myself absolutely love them use them all the time so if you're in the market definitely make sure you head on over their website use code diesel 2023 for 20 percent off site wide i also want to give a shout out to some of our patreon supporters tyler lowen a 23 diesel j cole john all of our other patreon supporters all of you who subscribe on youtube podcast apps follow us on tiktok instagram facebook we appreciate your support in your seven of the diesel podcast and look forward to bringing you more of the content that you want to hear in 2023 until next time keep the shiny side up 